Jameson. I, I, I bet you haven't heard that since your mom told you that. Uh, I typed it last night to somebody. Somebody <laughs> called me Jamie, and, and he said, uh, my parents told me to always call my elders by their real name. I said, well, you're going to have to start using Wilton, Jameson, Abersol. Hmm. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. Jamie, I am so thrilled that you've agreed to come on Jazz Piano Skills and spend some time with the Jazz Piano Skills listeners because you, my friend, are a legend. I have known you. I have known you my entire life, it seems like, from junior high school days, high school days. I grew up with you uh, working with all of your materials and play-alongs and books. Uh, in fact, you're the reason... You are the reason I ended up at North Texas State, University of uh, North Texas, because I was using your play-alongs with Dan Hurley playing the oh, piano. Yeah. And I said, man, I want to go study with Dan. And yeah. that's, how I end, that's how I ended up at the University of North Texas, because of you. I'll be darned. Yeah. I just, so, I just I emailed Dan the other day. Did you really? Yeah. Yeah, how's he doing? He, I had him on. He was on Jazz Piano Skills a few months back, and he seemed to be doing great. Yeah, I think he's doing all right. I was talking to him to get Jack Peterson. Do you remember him? Oh, I, I, I had many improv classes with Jack Peterson. Oh, did you? Yeah, Rich he, Madison, Jack Peterson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. You know, uh, let me tell you a quick story about Rich Madison. Uh, I always thought he was a pretty much of a, a kind of a swing Dixie-ish player. But then he reached a point in his life where he took my volume three, the two, five, one progression. And he said he practiced with it every day. There it is. There it is, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. Oh, that was good. Yep. He said he, he practiced with that every day. And I noticed and he would send me like a year later or so some solos that he had played in concerts. And I noticed his his, uh, his improvisation got more bebop -ish. Oh, you man, know, did it, it, did it, it ever. A little moved out of the swing air and more into the bebop thing. And I thought it was interesting that he used that volume three to help him make that transition. Yeah, wow. Rich was a great guy. He died too early. Way too, way too early. And I'll tell you, it was such a treat to be at North Texas at the time when Jack Peterson, Rich Madison, and Dan Hurley, Jim Riggs. Uh, you Ed know, Sof. Ed Sof, right. It, man, what a... You know, it was just a fantastic time, and I, I, I consider it an, an amazing blessing, no question about it. So, mm -hmm. so okay, you know what? I want you to I want you to go back. You know, I like I said, I grew up with you uh, through your play-alongs and through your books, but I want to know, and I know the jazz piano skills listeners want to know about you, the man. So, could you? Could you take a few minutes right now and go back to the beginning, your childhood, how you got into music? Did you come from a musical family? Did your mom and dad play? Were they jazz musicians? Start at the beginning and tell us about Jamie. Well, I was about uh, five years old when, uh, actually, I was probably four, and my older brother was four years older than me, and he got to take piano lessons. And I was upset that I didn't get to piano, take piano lessons. So I think it was a year later, I was five years old, and they let me take lessons. And... Uh, that would be about 19, uh, wow, 46, 45, somewhere in there. And I rode my bike over. It was about a mile away. Uh, you wouldn't do that today, of course. And right. I took lessons for um, five years. My mom made me work, uh, practice an hour a day, which got really old after a while. And we were right. doing the scales, you know, two octaves, for, I mean, uh, two hands, four octaves up and down through all the keys. And I liked a lot of the little tunes that she had me learning, sight reading and so forth. Of course, I learned bass clef and treble clef, which was going to really help me later on. Right. But uh, I was about 10 years old, I think, and I went in for a lesson, and she, uh, I sat down and started to play, and she said, Jamie, stop. And she reached in her desk and uh, got the $2 out and gave it to me, and she said, no, you go on home. You'll never be a musician. <laughs> so, so that was my beginning on piano. Uh, my mom and dad That's both hilarious. liked music. Um we never we ate breakfast together and we ate supper together, and we might have eaten lunch together. My dad had a florist, which was right next to the house, which was just a block from where I live now in New Albany. Wow. And my dad, we wouldn't eat a meal and, until my dad had put six or seven seventy-eight records on the Victrola RCA Victrola in the living room. So I got to hear all these uh, standards. No yeah. jazz, not really. And my dad liked Dixieland. He played the banjo, 
and he okay. also played a little guitar. My mom played the piano by ear and, um, and sang. Uh, and so they both loved music. And I remember them, when I was really young, it seemed like once a week they would go to the Madrid Ballroom, a dance place in Louisville, for all of these territory bands were coming through every right. week, different band, you know, right. and uh, listen to them. And we'd have a babysitter then while they went over and danced. Uh, but my family was very musical in that regard. My dad also played the banjo on a WHAS uh, radio show out of Louisville, Kentucky. I think they were called the Indiana Banjoliers. Wow. Well, anyhow, after I got fired from playing the piano, I made the natural switch to tenor banjo. And I lugged my banjo on uh, two buses to Louisville which is just across the Ohio River, but it would take me about an hour to get there and an hour to get home and a 30-minute lesson and so forth. And I lugged my dad's gold-plated banjo up to Main Street in Louisville. This was long before they had malls, so everything was concentrated downtown Louisville. And here's this little 11, 12-year-old kid lugging his heavy banjo up the street, you know. Uh, I took lessons. Well, actually, I was still playing the banjo when I was 15 or 16 years old. Because uh, I did some U.S. shows, U.S.O. shows down in Fort Knox, which incidentally, it's entirely possible that I played my band's well, one tune I knew, which was The World is Waiting for the Sunrise. It's entirely possible I played that at Fort Knox on a Sunday afternoon during one of those years there, and Cannonball Adderley and Nat Adderley were in the audience because they were <laughs> Fort Knox around that same time. <laughs> and I wow. was there playing my banjo. And then... <laughs> I think when I was 12 years old, I was in the uh, sixth grade. My older brother was four years older, and he quit band. Uh, actually, his uh, the band director at Norman High School fired him because he couldn't make the uh, commencement at the end of the year. Oh, okay, at sure. an Eagle Scout meeting. So he told my <laughs> he told my brother. He said, "Well, if you're not here for commencement, don't come to band next year." And I took up the alto sax. Wow. And then when I decided to go to college, I bought a clarinet. And I wanted to go to the Manhattan School of Music, but they uh, wrote me back a long time later saying they didn't offer the saxophone. So I ended up going to Indiana University. And there they didn't offer the saxophone either. This was the fall of uh, 1957. So I had to take bassoon, oboe, clarinet, and flute on a woodwind degree. And I don't think oh, wow. I took saxophone that first year. But the second year, a fellow named Roger Pemberton came. He played on the Merv Griffin show, and I think right. he played with Woody Herman. He was from Evansville. And he came for his graduate degree, and they let me study with him. So that was, and then right. I stayed there for five and a half years. After that, I think I was 20 years old, still going to college. And then I got brave enough to call David Baker up in Indianapolis, which was about 40 miles from uh, right. Indiana University. And I took a lesson from him. And that's when jazz-wise, theory-wise, scale-wise, harmony and so forth started to go together. He he told me I was playing the wrong scale on I playing a pure minor and I should be playing a Dorian. And then we formed a bond that lasted for uh fifty years almost. Wow. I kept playing yeah. the So that's kinda of, that was my musical journey. Along the way, uh my education was listening to jazz records and buying records over and over, buying a record, buying an L P every day for five bucks. I mean every week for five bucks and listening to it and wearing it out. That was my education until I got with David Baker. Wow. Well, you know, that's that's the old school way, right? Listening. Yeah. Listen, listening, listening. Yeah. You know, so I uh, can't go wrong there. So this is fascinating. So how did you get into the education side? Because I, you're, you know, you're an accomplished musician, but at the same time, you also have a passion for, oh, yeah. education, for education. And to be quite honest with you, Jamie, you know, when I think about the um, pioneers of jazz education, I go back to like John Mahegan, uh, yep. Jerry Co Jerry Coker, David Baker, and at the top of that list, it's you, my friend, because I can't think of anyone who has done more for for putting jazz materials in the hands of thousands and thousands and thousands of people around the world mm. that are wanting to learn this art form and study jazz. No one has done more than you. So h how did this passion for the education side and sharing this with others come about? Well, it's interesting that you would ask because when I was in college, I, I made this foolish statement to many people and it was, uh, I'll never be an educator. But I had a reason. <laughs> right. I, I'm serious. I had a reason for that. You had to go to so many student recitals. 
Right. And a lot of the people that were going to be, well, the back the thing, the word back then was, Jamie, get your education degree to have, to fall back on. Right. I mean, you remember right. that. Fall right. back on. Right. Not as a professional musician. So, but I, I heard these people practicing in the rooms next to me who were music educators, and I didn't think they played their clarinets or their trumpets or their trombones very well. And when I would go hear the recitals, uh, they weren't they weren't up to my snuff, so to speak. So I right. just I'm not going to be an educator. But right. Jim, when I got uh, I was in my senior year, I think, and I was thinking about getting married the next year, I believe, and a fella approached me in the spring of the year out in the parking lot and said, Jamie, uh, I'm teaching privately 40 miles from here down at uh, Seymour, Indiana on Saturday. And would you, uh, and, and I got a, I got a job uh, teaching in the school, so I can't do it. I, I'm, I'm quitting because I'm going to be busy this summer and then who knows what the rest of my life's going to be like. Would you like to do it? So I stood there in that parking lot thinking, well, you've told everybody you're not going to teach. But I quickly came to the realization that private teaching wasn't really teaching. So I could go ahead and take the job and get two bucks a half hour, you know, and drive 40, 80 miles on Saturday and do it. So I got down there and I found out I was very good. And I also found out right away that my ears weren't sharp enough because the kid would be playing out of the Rupert book on the clarinet or the flute and they'd miss a note. And I wouldn't know what that note is. I'd have to look over at the page and say, okay, now your G sharp key is stuck. You're not to raise that up, you know, or that's a B flat. Right. And you can do this. So I, right away, I realized, educating myself, that my ear training wasn't nearly good enough to do this job properly. So right. I really centered in on ear, ear training. And then one day, and this is a key moment, there was a flute player there. Her name was Susan Black, and she was oh. the daughter of a Dr. Black in Seymour. He was evidently the doctor. And she played her flute really well. There was a piano in the class, in the practice room. So we finished our lesson early, and I said, let's, let's try something. So uh, Miles Davis' So What had come out. So I said, let's take these two scales and, and let's see what you can do. I didn't use the word jazz, and I'm sure I didn't use the word improvisation. I just probably said, just play whatever comes to your mind. And I played the piano, walked the bass line, played the cards in the right hand. And she played, and as soon as she started to play, my brain says, uh, she's playing exactly what she hears in her head. Wow. She's not a jazzer. She doesn't listen to records. She doesn't drink coffee. She's not grumpy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Did None I, of the qualifications. Yeah, they are. <laughs> uh, so I asked her to move up a half step from D minor. Same thing. Then I probably asked some other people. And by the time I got back to IU uh, that Saturday, my brain was thinking, if you show people the scale and if they can play it, if they've been playing, you know, for six months or so and can play and finger it, they can improvise. So thus, anyone can improvise was born. Yes. Right. The right. Spot. right. I have her name and address over on my desk. I got it a couple of months ago and I need to take 20 minutes and start, write her a letter. She's up in D.C., I think. And thank That's her. That's amazing. Oh, my and gosh. Thank her. Because had she not done that, had she floundered, I would have right. continued thinking that you have to have a big stack of records, you have to have a good instrument, you have to hang right. out, this, that, and the other, but that's totally wrong. So that right. got me on the education thing, and when I got out of school, uh, I came right back to New Albany here and uh, rented an apartment. We were married then, my wife Sarah and I, and I started teaching half-hour lessons after school, and that gradually morphed into some kids that had been in high school. They didn't need help on the saxophone as much as uh, some of the beginners, so we started doing jazz lessons. That gradually morphed a couple of years later in 65. I was asked to do uh, Ken Morris's National Stage Band Camps. It was a big band camp. Right. So I started them in 65 and traveled to several cities around the country. And there, I was encouraging people after supper to get together with me for a listening class. I'd take records and wow. introduce Bonnie Rollins and Clifford Brown and wow. Miles Davis. And then we started wow. a little combo. And then that morphed uh, seven years later into combo camps. Right. We'd want to hire a whole lot of people. We'd have a whole bunch of combos, and the rest is kind of history, you know. Right. But that's, right. that's how I kind of gently walked into what we would call jazz education. And, of course, I took with me at the very early stage a European harmony theory, which I never cared much for theory. The theory to me was it didn't – I wanted to play, you know. Right. But since we had our first camp, 
the combo camp, I can remember Jerry Coker, Dan Hurley, maybe David Baker, and me, and we decided for the curriculum. And someone said, well, why don't we start out in the morning with a theory class? And I remember saying, oh, I, I don't think we want a theory class. We, let's start out playing. Well, no. Well, they convinced me that some theory was good. As soon as I started that theory class with 30 or 40 kids, I said, theory's where it's at, where it's at because they're not going to be able to play if they don't know what they're playing. And, right. and I don't want right. them playing. I don't want them to hear I'm getting lost. I'm playing wrong notes. So right. I started pointing to the page where they were on the page. Here, right. you're lost. Stop. Right. Let's start. And that, right. that was me. I've been that yeah. way ever since. Yeah, you know, that's interesting, Jamie, because I tell students all the time, you know, conceptual understanding drives physical development. I'm always saying that, you know, if, if, it's, if it's confusing or cloudy or foggy or fragmented here, then it's going to be confusing, confusing and fragmented and fragment, fragmented here, right? So oh, yeah. under, understanding like the, the, the music theory, the explanation of what understanding what's actually happening is of great benefit. Yes, and you reminded me of something else. Uh, and you, you'll know this way back there when the big band arrangements were written and so forth, the card symbols did not necessarily indicate the scale that the solo was supposed to use. Right. The cards were oftentimes written for the guitar or the piano player to voice on their instrument while the right. band was playing the big band arrangement. Okay. Right. And of course, that right. was long before I started writing out the scales and darkening in the card tones for the songs yeah. that we're going to play, you know. But to, so that was a precursor to taking this theory that you're talking about and, and trying to eliminate some of the confusion that Correct. goes on people's mind. There you go. That's exactly that's exactly right. So so you know this education uh, this education bug bit you and uh, Jamie Abersaw as we know it today it has it was born. But you know, you have an entrepreneurial spirit as oh. well there's no question about that because what you have built over the years is absolutely remarkable so but let's talk about the innovativeness of your dream of your vision and how it came about because you know when you think about the playalongs you know those books and you got you got a section for the c instruments you have a section for the b flat instruments you have a section for the e flat instruments all contained within one book you pull in these players you create these playalongs uh, tracks that that people can practice with. I, that, I mean, that's very innovative at the time that you were doing that. How did that come about? Well, uh, let me show you something. Uh, when I was in high school, I practiced with these. Play along? Okay, yeah. Modern Rhythm Maker's Record. Play or sing. Okay, got it. NBC rhythm section record. Right. So that gave me an idea. And then Interesting. I, I may have had one Music Minus One by Irv Kratka. You know, I remember had, me I remember Music Minus One, yeah, right. Music Minus One, MMO. And they had one where there were blues, uh, and Clark Terry. Clark would play a chorus or two with the rhythm section, and then there would be just the rhythm section for two choruses. And my right. brain said, Oh, this is really nice, but I've got all of Clark's records. What we need are just tracks. Right. And that right. got me started. And we came out with this. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, That's just volume one. Vo right. Just volume paper. One. Yeah. yeah. Volume one. Yeah. I typed yeah, up. but that that oh. that that book is phenomenal, though. That was that's um, that's an amazing, amazing resource. Yes. Yes, it is. And it gradually morphed into. <clears throat> Uh, well, we had numerous editions of Volume 1, and then finally right. we stopped saying revised edition because right. it's not so big and changed and so forth. Uh, right. And now it's got, uh, it's got two CDs. We've, we've taken the original tempo on those uh, recordings and slowed them down. Uh, and, and then we've taken... Uh, I'm playing piano on that Volume 1. Of course, everything awesome. I play is pretty much... Uh, uh, what do you call it? No roots. What's that called? Rootless, Rootless voice. Ro Rootless, Rootless voice. Voicing. Right, right. Yeah, and then the volume 54, which is very popular. I'm playing yeah. on that one, too. And we transcribe right. everything uh, yeah. to, make, to help piano players yeah. to stop playing, you know, the root down in the uh, left hand and, and right. root position cards in the right hand to come up yeah. with sounds more like jazz. Yeah. Uh, so that was 1967 when I came out with that. Actually... I think that's that came about 
with me working from 1965 on up to about 90 with the National Stage Band Camps because I realized that piano players and the bass players and the horn players, a lot of, this should be, it shouldn't be a big band camp. It should be a combo camp. These right. kids need theory. They need private instruction. They need to get their eyes off the written page and start right. seeing if they can improvise. So right. that was, that led to volume one in 1967, which was supposed to be the first one, first and only one, you know. And then a couple years later, we did the volume two blues. And then we finally got up to doing volume three that you held up. Dan, I'm, I can remember Dan Hurley saying, why don't we do a 251? I said, Dan, nobody knows what 251 is. He said, well, I think he said something like, well, if we do it, they'll know. I said, oh, okay, let's do it. And of course, I really revised, I really revised volume three. We've got two CDs with it, got extended tracks, got all those licks and things. I play all the stuff on the piano. Right. If you sit down and listen to that as a beginner, uh, and if that doesn't help you, then we're in trouble. Yeah, right. You know, that volume, that 251 volume, and then I think it was volume 16, getting it all together, yeah. I think is what you called it. Those two volumes, Jamie, changed my entire life. Okay, Get, now wait a minute. Uh, volume 16 is turnaround cycles and uh, okay, turn around. Okay, that yeah. one, the turnarounds, but then the, which one, is it volume 12? Which one is getting it all together? That's 21. 21, okay. 12, yeah. 20, I just had it backwards. So, yes, 21. That right there, that one. That one, the turnarounds and two five one, that was like gold. That was Good. like jazz gold. You, uh, I can tell you were a great student because you're picking out the things that I always saw were extremely important if you want to play a solo. Solos, right. are made, solos are made of bits and pieces of scales. Now, what's what's the big deal? Okay, scales. Nobody likes to practice scales. Scales are just scales unless you apply them. And as soon as you play jazz, you'll find you're playing bits and pieces of scales. Correct. And as you play one tune, go to the next tune, oops, I don't know that scale. So right. you need to work on that scale. Your fingers need right. to get a cut. But the brain's still going. It can right. sing through the right. tune, but, but it's the lack of application on the instrument. So um, I was using this one down in Moorhead, Kentucky, at Moorhead State University last uh, Friday. Uh -huh. And I put it up on the screen, the very first track, and I played a little bit. Oh, I played Drop the Needle on the track. That's what it was. And I asked them, is this track one or two or three or four or five? And they were supposed to listen to the bass and the chromatic movement or the cycle movement or whatever. And after we talked about that for 10 or 15 minutes, I said, okay, now, now what do you do with this track? And the boy in the front row said, you solo over. I said, exactly right. And I'm going to solo through all 12 keys, four bars a piece. And I dove in, and the first phrase I played was the uh, B O do 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 E ba do da do di. And then I stopped. I stopped the CD player. I said, "What is that?" Nobody knew. I said, "That's I love you, Porky, right. from Porky and yeah. Bess." I right. said, "That just came to my mind. I had the facility to do it. I started on the third C sharp, and I came right down to the G." Then I went up the arpeggio to the ninth, and my brain said, you've never played that before. That's from Porky and Bass. And then, <laughs> then I played the rest. And then I went ahead and played through all 12 keys, which took probably two minutes, I'm guessing. And when I finished, I said, that's why I'm here. That was really fun. And I know all of my 12 major scales. And that was just one time through. I'm ready to go right. through it for 50 times now because I'm using my right. imagination. I'm being creative. This is fun. And yes. I think, I, I, think yes. I got a point across to him that was very important, which is scales are important, and you, that's what music is made of. Yeah, you know, J Jamie, it was through those volumes that when I was practicing as a young boy that I came to the realization that melodies, music, consists of ascending and descending scale and arpeggio motion. And oh, yeah. So if, if I can learn ascending and descending scale and arpeggio motion i know the melodies of yeah. all these tunes that i want to play well that's so good it, it's a huge revelation when when a student can get to that point to where they realize wow music yeah. is going up or down and melodies mm -hmm. are using scale and arpeggio motion to do that now that brings up something else too you're talking about you you did this see i didn't do much of what you just did there the thinking part I was over on the right side of the brain, excited about playing, and I just yeah. played. Now, the thought that I was playing a scale or a chord, I don't know when. Well, I was probably 20 years old when David Baker said, Jamie, 
uh, what tune do you, would you like to play for your first lesson? I said, well, I've been working on I Remember April. We played it. He played the piano accompanying me. And then when we got to, we said that was fine. But in the fifth measure there, that goes to a Dorian minor scale and you're playing pure minor. Now, I was 20 years old and I've been playing for, what, 15 years? Right. And I'd never really thought, T-H-O-U-G-H-T, about what I was playing or what goes into playing music. He said, you need to raise the sixth note of the scale a half step. I had never thought numbers. And it took me it took me a while right. standing in this uh, living room to go up my E minor scale and find that the sixth note was C. And he yeah. wants me to raise it a half step to C sharp. When I played that scale, I said two things. Why didn't somebody tell me this before now? Yeah. And right. I said, that's the sound on the Clifford Brown, Sonny Rollins record with Max Roach that I've right. listened to over and over and over. That's the sound, that one That's note. It. Right. That's it. Yeah. yeah. So that got me thinking that thinking was OK. Yeah. Thinking's OK. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, just a side note real quick, Jamie, you, David Baker, Jack Peterson, you guys really make me uh, angry because. You guys like you're you're known as a sax player. David Baker's known as a trombonist, correct? And yeah. uh, Jack Jack Peterson, guitarist. And Jack always used to come in the improv classes, and and I'd be sitting at the piano. That all those piano players would be there together, and he'd shove us off to the side and sit down and 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 play voicings and show us what he was doing. And then he'd always get up with that little grin and he'd look and he'd say, he goes, guys, you know, he goes, I always hate it when guitar players play better piano than piano players. <laughs> and, and, we, <laughs> and you, you, uh, you play, you play a very fine piano. David Baker, you said is playing piano. Yeah. Jack Peterson. So, how does how does as an instrumentalist? I want you to address that for a second because it's important. I think right that instrumentalists yeah. have some pe uh, some uh, keyboard chops. Oh my, uh, that's why. Uh, I'll be right back. I don't know if you've seen this or not. Oh, yeah. Jazz Handbook? Yes. I've been putting that out. You know, I've printed hundreds of thousands of these. Right. Okay. Right. And they're free. And if anybody uh, watching your show wants them, just email me at jamie at jazzbooks.com. And I'll send you however many you want. Uh, but in the back of this book, which I, it used to be mimeographed, a staple together. And then someone right. said, you could have these printed on cheap paper for 10 cents. And I, I sold my A.B. Dick printer the next day. Somebody came and took it out. And I said, goodbye. I want no more ink, you know. And, and I started you. printing. But in, in, the, in the back, there's five pages. Yes. Of voicings for yeah. piano players. Yeah, I can say the piano to be, the piano is the key instrument because you can use your eyes and look at it. It's the and, best chalkboard. It's the best chalkboard that we have, is it not? Yes. Oh, yeah. It's, Right. It's, it's the best musical chalkboard that we have. Oh, it is. It's the best, yes. And, and you don't necessarily need to be able to play it. I can't really play it. I noodle at the piano. But every time uh, when I'm answering questions, say, in a class, someone says, Jamie, uh, what's the fourth note of blah, blah, blah scale? My brain sees the keyboard right up here. Right. Oh, it's so I'm important. Ever since college. It's right here. And yeah. I answer all the questions by looking at the keyboard and the intervals and the distance right. and so forth. Right. Uh, but this book here has beginning and it's an encouragement for horn players to learn something about piano. Yeah. Because See, I yeah. And I teach quite a few I, I, here at the school. I teach quite a few students, uh, instrumentalist uh, improvisation. The very first question I always ask them is, how are your keyboard chops? And, and, yeah. and they kind of they kind of look at me like, well, you know, I said, well, we need to we need to fix that. You need to get some mm -hmm. keyboard chops. You need to be, yeah. I, I say you just need to be a functional just be functional. You don't need to be, you know, you don't need to be Oscar Peterson. Just be, you, you got to study enough to be functional. So yeah. like what you're saying, the keyboard, that imagery is right there at the forefront of your mind. Uh, can I, uh, can we take a minute and move this over to the keyboard for a second? Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Let me move this over here and see. It. So we're repositioning the camera here. Jamie is getting it over by the piano. Okay, here we go. I mean, how many how many albums, Jamie, do you have there in your studio there, man? Uh, I think I have somewhere between fourteen and 15,000 LPDs <laughs> and CDs and so forth. It's, it's quite a bit. Oh, All what right. a library, man. That's, Let's see. Oh, my uh, there you, you can't there you really go. see my hands. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, we can see. Yeah, me, uh, is that better? Oh, yeah, that's that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. If, I always suggest this uh, starting with two fives, a D to G. Nice. Nice. Two fives and two five ones. Everywhere. Yes. Right. Three five seven nine and a right. Right. Hand. Right, and you're moving and you're moving around the circle. Oh well, a uh, little bit there, yeah. But I like I like to do two five ones up and down on half steps. Up. There you go. And you can leave the top note there. Nice, nice. Uh, or go down, go down on half steps. Nice. Or different voicings. Spread my finger out. This is right. E, 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 B, and then G, D, F sharp, A. Nice. And this is where this is where a long fingers come in handy. Nice. Down, down in whole steps. Right. Right. It's this beautiful. D different, yeah, different ways to move those two fives around, right? And, right. And, and a lot of people in the beginning, you, you know, I'm always amazed at how many people don't realize that, <laughs> believe it or not, that two five and what I'm getting at is like two five is circle motion, right? Counterclockwise circle motion. Now I just lost you. I wonder what I hit. I got an ad on here. Uh oh. Uh, well, we still hold got. On. We... I'm sorry about this. <laughs> so a little technical difficulty. If you're listening, uh, <laughs> listening to the audio version right now, but Jamie will be back with the video here. Accidentally hit a button, I guess. I took the video, yeah. uh, turned the, the video. The Kindle's coming. Off. I don't know what happened. We'll get that okay. back going, but audio is still live, so. I, I hit something trying to move the rubber so, band. <clears throat> get that microphone. Yeah. Tap that oh, microphone. There we go. There, there we go. Right, so the red one does it, right? Okay, thanks. So, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, the, for those of that listening, when we're talking about two five ones, we're talking about circle motion, counterclockwise circle motion. Right. Right. So I, as as a kid, I practiced them up and down in half steps, up and down in whole steps, two fives. That's awesome. Up a whole step. That's really good. Now, now here's G G minor. Go down in half steps. Now, how did you? How did you? How did you? Do, how did you come to that? Uh, how did you come to that exercise? Did somebody show you that, Jamie, or how did you determine no. the, the practice that way? I, I just made it up myself. Okay, so you I, just said I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna move in whole steps. I'm gonna move in half right, steps. I'm gonna play right. this two five one progression. Yeah. Okay. But because I realized that once my fingers could feel the notes and I didn't have to look at the keyboard, then that's the kind of freedom I was looking for. Yeah. Right. Right. And then, of course, if you're soloing, then you take that. Uh, here's something that I think is hard for piano players to do, and that is to give up the root. Oh, big time. Oh, big give time, up, right? Give up the, in other words, you hit F, A, C, E. But you hear that as a D minor. Oh, correct. Or you, can hear, you can hear it as F. But as far as the two five sequence goes, you don't want to hear it as F. It is correct. an F major part, but D is a root, so you practice. Yeah, that's great. Just the left hand. While you solo... But nice. I, I, tell, yeah. I think playing piano is one of the hardest, hardest things to do because yes, your left hand's got to accompany your right hand, and then you have to. If you're playing solo piano, then you need to get the roots involved, 
And right. if you're accompanying people, then you've got to get the cards going where yeah. where, you're yeah. playing, where you're not playing the roots because you have a bass player, you know. Right. And now right. you're playing four and five and six notes, but you don't want to get in the way of the horn player. So you have to learn how to do that within the first, uh, the two or three octaves in the middle of the keyboard. So there's a lot to it. To right. play. There's no doubt about it, right? It, yeah, there is, lot. but it, it's, it's uh, in a way, it's a lot more exciting playing the piano than a single line instrument like right. uh, trumpet, right. trombone, sax, clarinet. You got right. so much of your, uh, and also <laughs> it's good and it's bad. You can run the soloist in the ground by playing too much and too heavy. <laughs> too often. Happen, piano players have a problem of filling up space. We like to fill up space, <laughs> but, don't we? <laughs> yeah, they want to hear those keys hitting the strings all the time. Yeah. <laughs> all the time. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was Count Basie. I heard Count Basie one time say, pay attention to what I don't play. Pay attention to what I don't play. <laughs> right? Pay yeah. attention to what I don't play. You know, speaking um, melodically, Bebop scale is extremely, extremely, extremely important. And oh, that no. one note to the scale. Yeah, right. That half step, right. Yeah. And play, it, and play it. Once a person learns that bebop scale and gets that in their head and they utilize it, I always feel like their improvisation moves up about 20 years. Oh, oh my goodness. Great. The maturity level just goes way up. It's, it sounds like the jazz that we're used to hearing. Of. Correct. That's right. So talk a little bit about Talk a bit, a little bit about the summer camps. Your summer camps are internationally renowned and and um, partic uh, participated by thousands and thousands of students. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, that and the faculty, the fa the world class faculty that you have at these summer camps. Well, we're not having the camps anymore. Uh, this would be the third year that I haven't having COVID sort of crushed. Well, right. So uh, University right. of Louisville. Uh, I was afraid to do anything. Uh, they're doing their own thing this year. Without. Do you think, w will they come back? Do you think they'll come back? I don't know if I'll come back or not. Okay. okay. I don't know. Yes, but we had about a 54-year run. We, I started out in 65 working with uh, other people. I didn't own the camp or control it or anything. But I definitely tried to move the camp more to an individual basis where the emphasis was on improvisation and the individual as opposed to reading the notes on the page. Correct. And we found out there in about 1970, 71, 72, by having a couple of combo camps out in Utah at uh, Brigham Young University. Mm -hmm. And then the guy that was running the big band camps trusted me and we put together the combo camps with David Baker, Dan Hurley, Jerry Coker, Jack Peterson, you know, people like that. As wow. a matter of fact, I remember the very first combo camp was the week after a big band camp at up in Illinois, I think Champaign, University of Illinois. And I remember Rich Madison at the end of the big band camp telling me, Jamie, good luck on your camp this week. And I thought it was so nice that, he, that there wasn't any competition between big band and combo, you know, and right. he was welcoming us into this new era of combos. Right. So that's how we got started with that. They've been all around the world. They've been to Germany, yeah. Scotland, England, Denmark, New Zealand, Canada, Australia, uh, I think that's enough. <laughs> uh, yeah. But we, we've introduced this idea of using scales and cards in addition to using your imagination and so forth to thousands and thousands of people who I think have taken it and then taught the people in their country uh, yeah. about well, this one art farm called jazz. Yeah. Well, Jamie, you have to feel enormously uh, satisfied and pleased that I don't know of any jazz music. I have yet to run across any jazz musician, any jazz musician anywhere at any time that is not familiar with Jamie Aversall and Jamie Aversall materials. And that think if you just think about that for a second, there's not a jazz musician in the world that doesn't know you and the materials that you've produced and helped uh, students and musicians um, for for years, for decades. I mean, that's got to be. Do you stop to think about that once in a while and go, holy moly, I can't believe the profound okay. impact that I've had on this art form? I, I know I've had a tremendous impact, but I don't dwell on it, that's for sure. I wish well, we had I wish we had more people now doing it. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
Well, times have changed. I did a jam session about three weeks ago up in Bloomington, Indiana at a high school after school. There was 21 people there. About three of them were band directors. And I asked them, because I had my overhead projector and screen, and I brought some playlongs up to sell at 10 bucks a piece. Mm -hmm. I asked how many people have any of my playlongs. I think two hands went up. And they were probably the band directors. The young kids today haven't really heard of Jamie Aversol. Yeah, they don't well, know. I, I I don't know what's well. Okay. Well, you know what? You don't feel bad about that because uh, you know it wasn't too long ago. This was before Ed Shaughnessy died. Uh, I was on a plane back from California to Dallas, and Ed Shaughnessy was on the plane. And the flight attendant, he was sitting a few rows back. We had we had long conversation as we were waiting to board on the plane. And the flight attendant came to me and I said, hey, you know, you got one of the greatest jazz drummers to ever live on the plane. And she, oh. goes, Who? And she goes, who's that? And I pointed back to Ed Shaughnessy and she goes, Ed, who is Ed Shaughnessy? And I said, I said, Johnny Carson, Johnny Carson show. And the flight attendant said, who? Johnny Carson, who? <laughs> So, so if people aren't remembering Johnny Carson, man, you're 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 in good you're in good company. Yeah, that's right. No, times change, but oh. the main thing I've always said is, let me hear you play. Let me hear you play, and within you know four measures, I can tell if what they're playing is coming straight from their hand. Yeah, or right. Just moving their fingers, and it's right. a bunch of what do you call it, gibberish, gibberish. gibberish. Yeah. It's just, just stuff, it's not yeah. music, and we don't want right. to hear. It. And we, right. that's that's not the way to play. So I stop them, you know, and we yeah. start again. Listen, uh, let me mention well, a short story. Many years ago, there was a guy named David Linhart. He's still very much alive, and he plays piano. He played with John Hendricks for a while, and he also plays with Houston Person. He was from Louisville, and he came over to my room right next door here, and he was in my combos. And we had a piano, bass, drums, and probably two or three horns. So we had combo. Instead of having individual lessons, we had combo several, uh, once a week, this group. Right. And they were playing, and I walk over to David, and he's playing the root down in the left hand on every card as he accompanies the other guys. And I said, David, you don't need to play your roots down there. We've got a bass player playing those. And I forgot about it. The very next week, we're playing. I'd forgotten all about that. He's playing the roots up in the right hand. I came over and said, <laughs> David, you don't need to play the roots up here in the right hand. We have a bass player. And he shouts to me. He's a teenager. He shouts. Well, you told me not to play them down in the bass last week. <laughs> <laughs> so from, so a, just... from, from a piano perspective, we've got to have a root somewhere, Jamie. Well, where can I put this root? Right. <laughs> now, now, we laugh about that. He's become a professional piano player. As a matter of fact, he spent about a year. There Way you back, go. Transcribed yep. all of this. And I have his handwritten notes up here. And I remember this was uh, 1980. Oh, that's awesome. so that, so 40 years ago, he transcribed it. He handed me the book, and he said, Jamie, I don't want to ever hear you comp again. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. You know, oh. just right now, us laughing is another aspect of playing jazz. Jazz is fun. We have so many jokes. And oh I tell gosh. You, you have to learn to laugh at yourself. Why? No because your instrument is not going to always play what you hear in your head. And it's going to be points where you're ready to take a hammer to that piano. But yeah, you gotta, I, you right. laugh just go straight ahead. Uh, don't, I, I, don't, don't give up. Don't give up. There's no right. shortcut, but you're going to get there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I tell students all the time, you're going to have to embrace the good, bad, and ugly because it all exists. It, yeah, right? it, sure it, it, it comes it, with the package. It comes with the package. So, yeah. um, okay, I'm going to I'm going to throw out I want to throw out for our jazz panel skills listeners. I want to throw out some uh jazz concepts some jazz skills and i just want you to talk off the top of your head to give the listeners some do's and don'ts about how to approach this topic okay so i'm going to just right. throw um number one tune study students that are wanting to increase their repertoire increase their ability to play tunes what are some recommendations that you can give listeners the do's and don'ts about approaching how to uh, properly learn tunes well, I think myself and most of the people in my era, before the books came out that Jamie provided for us, you know, to give these melodies away, we listened and we listened and we listened and we listened and we listened. And then finally, we went over to our instrument. I would go to my saxophone, try to play that. Right. You know, that melody, just the melody. Right. And you got to do the same thing with the piano. But like I said earlier, the piano, you have more to do. Wow. 
you play that melody in the right hand and you want to play cards in the left hand, you know? Right. And if you don't, a lot of people that come to my jazz camps, came to my camps over the years, they, when they go home, they don't have anybody to play with. All right. right. And they don't have any stretch and they don't have a class to go to. So their comment is always, uh, I keep forgetting these tunes. Well, right. I go back to the way I learned to play, which was I'm still playing these records by Art Blakey and Bill Evans and Herbie Hancock and Sonny Ron. The music is going on all the time. So how can I forget the tune? You know, right. Right. now I may forget how to finger it because I haven't played it in a while, but that just takes some practice. So I think for me, getting my mind to hear those tunes and think about the intervals that it took to put that tune, that melody together and then. The books that you could get if you're a piano player, that would, for instance, right, right, show you Absolutely. The, right. the non root voicings. Just show you a couple of them. I, I've always said I would rather the band director at a high school, if they're playing the, um, if they're playing B flat blues and F blues, then please buy this. Right. You know, back then it was right. probably six bucks. Have the student memorize one chorus of what I play, rootless voicings, and play that because that's going to be better than playing. Uh, right. root position voicing through the whole tune with no imagination. Right. So I think to immerse yourself in one song, for instance, to start with, uh, and then learn that melody, be able to play it slowly, then maybe work it up to tempo, but don't bite off more than you can chew. And, and right. it's, it's, a, it's a long process, I feel, for the piano player. Much yes. more difficult than for trumpet or saxophone. Yes, Sax, agreed. You play scales, you play your notes, so far, right. and you're ready to improvise. On the piano, you start to play, and yep. nobody's playing that root, and you can't even hear what the note is of the scale you're playing. Right. So I th this is where some, I think, piano books do come in very handy for a piano player to learn right. how to get the tunes together. You know, we right. say, do you, do you know a tune? Now, I'm going to move over to piano just for a second. Okay. That's not very pianistic, but you can hear the melody. And you I think sure I probably like the uh, the harmony that I put in there. So uh, this leads me to something else, which was <clears throat> when I was taking my piano lessons between the age of five and ten, I would hear occasionally, Jamie, you're just messing around. It's that messing around where you find the secrets to what's going on. It's the messing yeah. around. Yeah, yeah. To have what you're playing on the keyboard finally right. come close to playing what so and so played, Errol Garner played on the record, yeah, or Oscar Peterson played on right. the record, you know? and right. then later what Herbie Hancock or Chick Corea yeah. or Keith Jarrett's playing. It's a messing around, I think, yeah. oftentimes that the piano players don't do that they should do. Yeah, you can't be you can't be afraid to roam. You can't. Be afraid, right. Yeah, you, you don't cannot be afraid, afraid to roam. And, yeah. But then that, when you're doing that, you have to be thinking. That's an F minor chord. That passing card was a G minor chord. The next one up is a half step, step right. A flat minor. And it's well, yeah, that's yeah, that's exactly right, Jamie. I tell students all the time that because they ask how to. I said, if you want to learn how to play tunes, learn how to hear tunes. Oh, good. Oh, right. Yeah. L learn how to hear tunes. You want to hear these two five ones, one six two five ones, three yeah. flat three two flat two one. You oh, want to yeah. hear this motion, right? right? I had an old I had an old jazz piano player. Uh, I grew up in Illinois in the Quad Cities, and there's an old jazz, 88er from Decatur. His name was Warren Parrish, and Rich Madison knew him well. Uh, and he said to me, I asked him one time, I was a young kid, and I asked him, Warren, how is it that you know so many songs? I said, if mm -hmm. anybody requests a tune, you can play it. Any key, you can play it. I, I said, I'm just, and he took his little cigar out of his mouth. And he, and he looked at me like, Jamie, like I asked him the dumbest question in the world. And he, he blew the smoke out of, his, out of his mouth. He said, what are you talking about? And I said, how do you know so many tunes? And he goes, Bob, he goes, they're all the same. <laughs> so think about that. He hear, yeah. he, 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 he hearing music so well that he's hearing all this harmonic yeah. movement that exists in all these tunes. Sure. You know, so, the, so the melody may be different, but he, a 2 five, one's a. Right. Two yeah. five one, 
you know? Yeah. So, uh, you know, at the time I thought, I thought I, at, at the time, because I was only 14, I thought, what a kook. These songs are not all the same. He does it. He's nutty. He's nutty as a fruitcake. Well, now yeah. 40, 40 years later and after a lot of teaching, I look yeah. back and I marvel, marvel at how profound that statement was yeah. and yeah. in the depth of which he understood music. Right. And that brings up another thing. Uh, jazz education. See, that man wasn't thinking jazz education. And if you mention it to him, he would probably say, why do we need jazz education? All you have right. to do is hear, you know, that's right. That's right. In fact, Jamie, I'll tell you, I, I, I went home from college one day and I, I went and listened to him play. And I said to him, I said, Warren, I really enjoy your use of the tritone sub. And he goes, huh? he goes, <laughs> he said, he goes, what the hell's a tritone sub? And I, and, and, and I said, well, you know, like when you went from the you went from like that D minor to the D flat seven to the C major. And he said, are you you mean the flat two? And I said, I said, yes. And he said, well, then why the hell didn't you say that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that remind, here, here's volume one. The last track. Right. Yep. There. Yep. There you go. See, and, and, and a lot of people back then were saying, Jamie's giving all the information away. He's, <laughs> right. oh, oh, really? There, I, yeah. I can remember a very professional... Oh. Well, I'll say it was John Laporta. Uh -huh. I was at a big band camp at Stores, Connecticut, and we had gone out with somebody in their car to get an ice cream cone. I'm in the back seat, and I'd just come out with my first play-along record. Of course, it looked like this right. with LP, you know, right. that I lugged on the airplane up there and was trying to sell a couple to the students. And he must have understood that my first three tracks were Dorian Manners. So he's eating his ice cream, and I'm in the back seat, and the guy's driving, and John says, I don't consider to be the Dor the Dorian Meyer scale to be an entity in itself. Well, that went right over my head until I got back to the dormitory, and then I realized he didn't like my new approach to jazz uh -huh. improvisation, of uh -huh. of telling the student what the scale is. Uh -huh. At that time, I didn't even darken in the card tones. As a matter of fact, there wow. was a scale page, and I just put the symbol F minor period yeah. F minor seven. Yeah. They were supposed to know that scale. If they didn't know it. They went back to the page. Yeah. But my point in saying this is, I think I was of the opinion early on that if you showed the person the scale that's being sounded, that would help them to play the sound and to possibly make music and improvise and feel good about what they're doing and not give up, not give up.